Our first reading today is from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. This is one of my favorite passages. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading from the epistle. Our second reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading from the Gospel. Will you pray with me and for me as we move into the Word together? Holy God, bless the speaking and the hearing.
hearing of these words, that our hearts might be opened to the depth of your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started in earnest today, there are a couple of things we need to clarify. If we were to read this passage too literally, we could be led astray or at least distracted by some of what we just heard from Matthew. First of all, in the many centuries, or at least the last couple since the Bible was written, the civilized world has decided that slavery is bad. In ways the gospel writers, embedded as they were in their cultures, could not bring themselves to come out and say. This is not to say that slavery has been effectively abolished, for we know that there are still those held in bondage, hidden in the dark corners of our global economy. Nor are we free of cruel systems that imprison one way or another people with certain kinds of debt. But for the most part, we have evolved to a point where we can say with confidence that Jesus is using a problematic metaphor here. Secondly, we need to note that aspects of this portrayal of God do not align with most of what we know about God. If you read the text closely and literally, it seems that Jesus is holding us to a higher standard than God. The master in the story to whom Jesus compares God only gives the first slave one chance at being forgiven. But we're being asked to forgive 77 times? Something seems off here. And when the final line suggests God is going to torture us if we don't forgive everyone else ourselves, it's clear that some expert level exaggeration or something is going on here. So, to be clear, slavery bad, God more forgiving than we can ever hope to be. While we're clearing things up, we should also note that in the passage we read from Romans, Paul is not knocking vegetarians. This was a culturally specific example in which Paul is reflecting on the question of whether or not Christians should eat meat that had been sacrificed at pagan temples and then sold at the adjacent butcher shop. Many Christians considered it tainted, which Paul sees as the weaker position because it gives the pagan gods a weight of reality he feels they don't deserve. I'm pretty sure we no longer have any butcher shops that are connected to pagan temples, so this isn't really a salient contemporary example. But there are plenty of other examples. The fact that these two passages are so embedded in their cultures is actually what offers us a useful lesson today. So often we think of the lessons we learn in church as nice and good in an abstract, idealistic sort of way. But when someone, say the preacher or our kids, suggests that we're supposed to apply those lessons to the actual things that happen in our actual lives, we sometimes get a little testy. There is a reason Jesus and Paul were using examples that were actually happening around their listeners at the time. It's because they were trying to convince them that the gospel was supposed to connect with their real lives as it is intended to connect with our real lives. We know in theory, that we're supposed to forgive and not judge people, but when opportunities arise to do either of those things, we're just as likely to think of rationales for why our grudges and judgments are entirely appropriate. 
as we are to remember the words of Jesus. Even if we do have a moment of pause, recalling the Christian imperative to forgive, we'll often tell ourselves, but how could God expect me to forgive this? Surely this is unforgivable. Or we'll go for the more faithful sounding, may God forgive them because I certainly can't. And maybe we can't, but we're supposed to try. That's part of what it means to follow Jesus. We're supposed to forgive, Jesus told Peter, not just seven times, but 77 times, or even as you've heard from other translations, 70 times seven times, which is 490 times for those of you who are math challenged. And here's how I know Jesus meant for us to apply this to all the real life stuff we'd like to pretend is exempt from these high standards. Did you notice what that story is really about? It's not about slavery. You could pull all the stuff about slavery out and the story would still be standing. It's about debt. It's about money. Who has it and who owes it and whose debt is going to lock them into a situation where they're never going to be able to pay it off. It doesn't get any more real life than this. This story made me think of that prayer Jesus taught us. For most of my life, I thought it was weird that most of the Protestant churches I went to use the version of the Lord's Prayer as we do that says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When I lived in the South, we said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, which was a weird shift. But I always thought it would have been more honest and direct to just pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That's what we're talking about, right? Sin. So why don't we just say so? But in the last few years, I've been thinking about this more, and I think we need to assume that there is some significance in the fact that we use the words debt and debtors. I think Jesus keeps using this money language in his teachings about forgiveness precisely because he knows that we would prefer to spiritualize forgiveness in order to avoid having to practice it in our real lives. One could say the same thing about Paul's examples of eating or not eating meat or observing or not observing holidays. Decisions about food and how we structure our time are some of the most fundamental influences on our lives. And those are apparently exactly the areas of life in which Paul thinks we should stop judging one another. He seems to agree with Jesus that these major principles of our faith should actually affect how we behave every day of the week. I can feel my subconscious whining. This is a hard teaching. Do I really have to be forgiving and non-judgmental all the time? When I'm driving on the highway, a lot of those people really are bad drivers. When I'm on social media, everyone knows some of those people are bots. When I'm listening to the news, Lord help. I don't know which part of your life makes this hardest for you, but I'm guessing we all have our areas where we struggle. We cannot expect this to be easy. The point is not to succeed, but to try. While we're forgiving 77 times, we can try to be gentle with our own failures at least seven times or so. I do think Jesus was exaggerating when he implied God would hand us over to be tortured for our failures to forgive. That is not what the heart of the gospel shows us. Peter's, Paul's description is more helpful. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's.
Whether we forgive or whether we fail to forgive, we are the Lord's. Whether we tame our hearts or whether we think judgy thoughts, we are the Lord's. Whether we loan money or whether we owe money, we are the Lord's. Whether we eat healthy or whether we continually cheat on diets we knew wouldn't work anyway, we are the Lord's. Whether we let other drivers in during a merge or whether we honk when someone cuts us off, we are the Lord's. Whether we delete the snarky comment or whether we post it, we are the Lord's. And if we can stay conscious enough of being the Lord's in all of those moments, the forgiving and the not judging will become easier. Because we will grow in our awareness of just how much God is continually forgiving us and just how unconditional God's love for us really is. That is how we learn to dwell in the mercy of God. And when we dwell in the mercy of God, forgiveness doesn't just flow into us, it flows out from us as well. When we dwell in the mercy of God, acceptance and unconditional love don't just enter our hearts, they radiate from us to others too. We are the Lord's. Hallelujah and Amen.